said, Amen. Amen. Another Amen. Amen. A resounding Amen. Amen. I welcome you tonight to our leadership development. We thank the Lord for what the Lord is doing. I will thank the Lord for what we learned last week. And I pray that the word will bear fruit in every life in Jesus' name. It's one thing to learn. It's one thing to listen. It's another thing to make that word enter into the heart, penetrate the heart, and produce the result. The word will produce result. In every one of our lives, in Jesus' name, no exception. Everyone that hears the word of God must respond positively, practically, to that word of God and the people outside who do not know what we're hearing. When they see the fruit and when they see the product and when they see the practical events and efforts in our lives, they will know we are being with Jesus. And I pray it will be evident in every life that we are being with Jesus in Jesus' name. We are here once again and we are here to learn. We are here to read the word of God and to study. And I pray that what we hear and what we learn will bear more fruit, thirtyfold, sixtyfold, a hundredfold in every life in Jesus' name. A good amen. amen. Father, we thank you tonight. We bless your name because you brought us together again. And we're asking, Lord, you'll do something in every heart, in every life, in every family, and in the whole ministry in Jesus' name. I pray we'll not treat the word in vain. We'll not learn the word in vain. Will not study the word in vain, but the word will make a powerful effort, effect in every life in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. We're coming to Isaiah chapter 35, and I'm reading from verse 8. Isaiah chapter 35, we're reading from verse 8. And an highway shall be there, and a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those that way fearing men, though fools shall not walk, shall not err therein. No lion shall be there, nor any ravenous beast shall go up thereon. It shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk therein. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. As you look at verse 8, it talks about the way of holiness. After we have experienced that sanctifying work of grace in our hearts, he puts that purity and that holiness in the heart. And he makes us to live out that life of righteousness in a deeper way, that life of holiness in a sanctified way that we will know we were saved because we were saved we became new creatures in Christ and now we are sanctified and after that sanctification there is holiness higher than the one you might have heard when you were saved deeper, greater, broader and richer than the one you had when you were saved in life at home and in the ministry, holiness makes us better. Holiness makes us more useful. Holiness makes us more profitable. True holiness makes a better neighbor. You are holy, you are sanctified, you are purified. That makes you a better neighbor. 
makes you a better friend. You're being a friend to somebody. Now you are saved. Now you are sanctified. That holiness experience, that purity of heart, that sanctification makes you a better friend. In fact, it makes you a better citizen in the country. Any country where you are, when you are sanctified and the holy nature of God is in you, it makes you a better citizen, a better professional. Any profession you have, your character, your morals, and your interaction, and your faithfulness, and your honesty makes you a better professional, a better civil servant. You're working in with the government, and now you're saved, and now you're sanctified. That makes you a better civil servant. You're a worker in the church. You're a worker in an NGO. The fact that you are sanctified and the fact that you are holy and you walk in the way of holiness, that makes you a better worker. Your marriage, a husband, makes you a better husband, a wife. Holiness makes you a better wife, your parents. Holiness makes you a better parent. Your children, holiness makes you a better child. You're a member of the church and you're truly sanctified. That holiness makes you a better member of that church. Or you're a minister, you're a preacher, you're a pastor. The holiness experience makes us better ministers in the church. Holiness is productive. Holiness does something. Holiness is not dormant. Holiness is not empty. Holiness is not unproductive. Holiness makes you do something that people will know. Here is a holy man. Here is a sanctified man. Here is a holy woman. Here is a sanctified woman. And it pervades all your life. It penetrates all your life. The holiness we're talking about and the holiness the Bible presents makes you a distinct, unique different person. It tells us in Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 74. In verse 74, that he would grant unto us that we being delivered out of the hands of our enemies might serve him without fear. And then in verse 75, in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our lives not only sunday sunday holiness every day all the days of our lives any day you find yourself in the market all the days of our life any day you find yourself in the office all the days of our lives any day you find yourself in your village or in the bus on the road anywhere you are all the days of our lives there is no day that we take vacation from holiness. Oh, today I'm not in church. Today I'm not on the pulpit. Today I'm not preaching. Today I'm not ministering. All the days of our lives, whether you are preaching or not, how much time do we spend on the pulpit? A very short time compared with the whole day. And so all the days of our lives, we are holiness unto the Lord. Our lives produce holy acts. Holiness begets hospitality. Holiness produces honesty. Holiness produces hope. Holiness brings honor. Holiness even speaks up our healing and holiness preserves our health. Holiness produces humility in our lives. Holiness comes with happiness. And finally, holiness will come with heavenly heritage. Think about that. If we are holy, if we are sanctified, if the power of the blood of the Lamb dips his hand powerfully in our heart, in our soul, in our spirit, when that holiness work, holiness experience is wrought, there will be hospitality. There will be honesty. There will be no dishonesty in the place of work. 
there will be no dishonesty in any work we're doing. We'll be honest if we're really holy. And there will be the hope of heaven. He that has this hope in him purifies himself, even as he is pure. If the holiness, our lives will be honorable, our lives will be respectable, our lives will be appreciated by the people who have contact with us, who relate with us. If there is holiness, you know what the word of God says? The word of God says, if you shall diligently hack in to the voice of the Lord your God and will do all that I command you, I will put none of these diseases upon you which are brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth you. That's telling us that holiness produces healing and health in our lives. Holiness produces humility. I've shown you, O oh man, how you ought to walk, that we ought to walk in humility with our God. Holiness makes us happy. Happy are ye, blessed are ye, when you have all these things, and then you have purity of heart, heavenly heritage, heavenly inheritance, heavenly reward. Heavenly presence entering into heaven without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. There can be hospitality, there cannot be holiness without hospitality. You have holiness, there'll be hospitality. On the other hand, there can be hospitality without holiness. The Samaritan that we read about and studied about during the period of Sunday Scripture Review. Good Samaritan, not godly Samaritan, not holy Samaritan. If that Samaritan stopped there for the good works, that does not take him to heaven. Actually, the question that the man asked what shall I do to inherit life eternal? And Jesus said, what have you read? And he said that you will love the Lord with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. And the second commandment is like unto that, that you will love your neighbor as yourself. The two parts there, you love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, that's the holiness experience. And then it will show forth in your response and your reaction to your neighbor. You love your neighbor as yourself. The man did not ask about the root of the matter. What's the root of the matter? Your love to God. Your devotion to God. Your experience in God. How you depend on God and what God does in your life. The root of the matter is to love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. He asked about the branch of the tree. That you will love your neighbor as yourself. And he said, who is my neighbor? And the Lord told him about his neighbor. And he said, go and do likewise. But that's just a branch of the tree. You need to have the root of the experience. There can be hospitality without holiness. But there can be no holiness without hospitality. Does your holiness produce harmlessness? That now you are holy and you harm no one. You hurt no one. Does your holiness produce helpfulness because you are holy, you are helpful, you are hospitable, and you are lifting up other people, and you are helping other people? Does your holiness produce harmlessness, helpfulness, and real happiness in the lives of other people? Or does your holiness make other people sad? Other people unhappy, other people less than human being, other people oppressed. If there is holiness, it will produce harmlessness. 
it will produce helpless helpfulness and it will produce happiness in the lives of the people around us tonight we're looking at the message the true experience of holiness for life and ministry the true experience of holiness for life and ministry we're looking at three points number one the insufficiency of samaritan hospitality without holiness of heart the insufficiency of samaritan hospitality without holiness of heart we're coming to luke chapter 10. in luke chapter 10 we're reading from where the story began sometimes when you cut off the root of the story the origin of the story and the first part of the story are you holding on to the latter part of the story we can go astray and that's what many churches have done they've held to the latter part of the story and we're not talking about salvation we're not talking about forgiveness we're not talking about justification we're not talking about the grace of god they've sent forth their people to go and be a good samaritan and in the human effort of those members they have tried their best to be good samaritans but even if you measured up to be in a good samaritan but not a forgiven sinner and not a free sinner and not a person that becomes godly and saintly you will still not get to heaven the insufficiency of samaritan hospitality without holiness of heart i'm reading from luke chapter 10 and i'm reading from verse 25 and behold a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him saying master what shall i do to inherit eternal life that's the real thing inherit eternal life if what we do will not make us inherit eternal life we need to re-examine what we're doing if what we do will cut us away from god on the final day we need to check up what we do might look good what we do might look fruitful what we do might look uh, kind of um, profitable to human beings and even profitable on earth but the question is is that all i do to inherit eternal life is that all i will be to inherit eternal life and he said unto him what is written in the law what is written in the word of god how readest thou and he answering said thou shalt love the lord thy god hold on thou shalt love the lord thy god and he came tempting the son of god we can know the word in the head we can know the word in our mind we've read it how read us thou well if i'm going to have eternal life i must love the lord my god with all my heart how about what you have come for tempting him tempting christ tempting the son of god is that part of the knowledge you have to love god with all your heart or your soul and then he says i was all thy soul i was all thy strength and with thy mind and thy neighbor as thyself this man was like one of the pharisees they know the word but they don't practice the word and he said unto him thou hast answered right this do what's that love the lord your god with all your heart all your soul all your mind all your strength this do and then love your neighbor as yourself you cannot cut off that last part love your neighbor as yourself and run with that stay 
and examine your love for God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And then after giving the first place to God, that you love God first, you seek the kingdom of God first, you are forgiven your past sins, your life is turned around, you are sanctified, you are made holy. Now, your neighbor as yourself, this do, and thou shalt live. But he willing to justify himself, you understand, somebody who really wants save, to be saved, will not want to justify himself. He is unjust, he wants to justify himself. He's a sinner, he wants to justify himself. He has knowledge, he's not put into practice, he wants to justify himself. He came for argument. He came so he can argue. Are you telling me I'm not all right? Are you telling me I'm not, you know, doing the word of God? This do and thou shalt live. Okay. Justify himself, said unto Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And Jesus answering said, and then told him the story. It's not asking a question about the God side of the issue. And the Lord would have answered him, but he wanted to justify himself. And all he wanted to do was, I'm a good neighbor too. I love my neighbor too. I'm a Pharisee. I love my Pharisee neighbors. I'm a Sadducee. I love my Sadducee neighbors. I'm of this tribe. I love my tribal neighbors. That's what he saw Jesus was saying. That's your neighbor. Then the one living next door. He said the one far away. The one you despise. That is your neighbor. And told him about the good Samaritan. But you understand that being a good Samaritan is not enough. Hospitality is not a substitute for holiness. Holiness of heart. Holiness in your mind. Holiness deep within you. Hospitality is not a substitute for holiness. Not only that, sincerity is not a substitute for salvation. Somebody says, you know, I do everything to be sincere. I try to be sincere in my life. That's good. That's good. Like the acts of the good Samaritan, that's good. But that's not enough. Sincerity is not a substitute for salvation. Nice behavior. I try to behave myself. I try to do the right thing when people are there, when the opposite gender is there. I try to carry myself in an honorable way. My friend, please understand that nice behavior is not a substitute for the new birth. Ye must be born again. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And actually, self-denial is not a substitute for sanctification. Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. That word holiness there means sanctification. It's the work of grace that God does in the heart. And only God can sanctify you. Only God can purify you. Only God can make you holy. If you abandon God, abandon His grace, abandon faith, and then by yourself, by self-effort, I deny myself of this. You know, since I start coming to church, I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't do this, I don't do that. I try to withdraw myself from anything that will not be right. Self-denial is not a substitute for sanctification. Fervency is not a substitute for faith. Fervency. I'm fervent. Anything I try to do, I put my whole zeal into it. I sweat. That's all right. But sweating 
heart will not take you to heaven. Fervency, fervent in business, fervent in activity, fervent in this and fervent in that is not a substitute for faith, except you have faith in Christ. Because it says the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. If you don't believe the gospel, if you don't have faith in Christ, who came to take our sins away, are you only fervent, fervent, fervent? That's not enough. Fervency is not a substitute for faith. Passion. A person is passionate. Passion is not a substitute for purity of heart. Our hearts must be purified by the application of the blood of the Lamb. And all these uh, self, uh, personal things we generate by ourselves. Anything coming from the life of a man who has not been in contact with God. He has not been in connection with God. And there is no conversion. And he's just trying by himself his animal energy. Human energy. And that passion by itself, without purity of heart, there is no substitute there. You know, there are some people that are naturally bold. Naturally bold and very aggressive. And they are fearless. They fear nothing. They fear nobody. Even if it's going to bring a devastating consequence on their lives, they fear nobody and they fear nothing. But you understand, boldness is not a substitute for the baptism in the Holy Spirit. It shall receive power. You realize how bold Peter was when Christ says something? And Peter boldly took hold of him and said, That will not happen to you. Natural boldness. Do you realize how bold he was? Jesus walking on the water. And the disciples were afraid. And then he said, If that's your Christ, bid me to come on the water. And Jesus said, Come. And he came out of the boat, that man naturally bold. And he came to take Jesus Christ. And as he saw they were going to take Jesus, he drew out his sword and he snatched off the ear of that person, Malchus, the servant of the high priest. But he shall receive power, real power, real boldness. After that, the Spirit of God has come upon you. If you have natural boldness, natural fearlessness, you can dare anything, you can do anything that's not a substitute for the baptism in the Holy Ghost. And joy is not a substitute for, ju for justification. There are people, they are cut out, they are extroverts, and they are positive. Anything happening in life, Always happy, always joyful, always humorous, almost a plain a prank. But that is not a substitute. You must be justified. And the sacrifice of Christ on the cross of Calvary must have that justification effect in your life. Happiness. Always happy. I look at the positive side of life. I look at what makes me happy, and whatever will not make me happy, I look away from it. I'm a happy man. I'm a happy woman. That's right. That's good. But happiness is not a substitute for holiness. We mustn't think that because the good Samaritan did what he did, then he just entered heaven. We still have to ask the other part of the question. Did he love God with well, all the such? Did he even know God? The God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob. Did he know God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ? Did he hear the gospel? Did he know the gospel? Was he born again? We must ask that question and see that we love God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our might, with all our strength, and remember 
that being a good Samaritan is not enough to get to heaven. Look at this. We're looking at um, Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. I'm reading from verse 3. Hebrews chapter 13. Go back to verse 2. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers. For thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Remember them that are in bonds, as bound with them, which suffer affliction, as being yourselves also in the body. And that's good. You remember those who are suffering, and you are ready and you are willing to alleviate their suffering. But look at verse 12. Wherefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people, if taking care of strangers, if that's enough to get to heaven, entertaining strangers, if that was enough to get to heaven, and those who are in bonds, remembering them, if that was enough to get to heaven. How about this verse 12? Verse 12 will not be there. It's good to entertain strangers. It's good to be hospitable. It's good to give a helping hand. But you must remember, uh, wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Let us go forth, therefore, unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. For here have we no continuing city, but we seek one to come. As we look at Acts of the Apostles, we're reading from verse 1. Acts of the Apostles, we're reading from verse 1. What we are pointing out from Scripture is being a good Samaritan is not enough. You must be a godly saint. A godly saint. We're looking at Acts chapter 10. And I read from verse 1. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band a devout man and one that feared God with all his house and which gave look at this which gave much arms to the people and prayed to God always give much arms to the people and he prayed to God always. An angel appeared to him. By the way, seeing vision does not mean that you are qualified for heaven either. Because this must saw the vision of an angel. And the angel said, all that you have been given has come as a memorial before God. Is that enough to get to heaven? Look at this. We're looking at chapter 11 of Acts. Acts chapter 11. I'm reading from verse 13. And he showed us how he had seen an angel in his house, which stood and said unto him, Send men to Joppa, and call for Simon, whose name, whose surname is Peter. Who shall tell thee words whereby thou and all thine house? Tell me the rest. Tell me, tell me. Say it aloud. Shall be saved. He was given arms, was sent to Peter. He'll tell you words how you'll be saved. He already he was praying, fervent in prayer. Every time praying, praying to God. But send for Peter, he'll show you how to be saved. He saw a vision. An angel spoke to him. The vision did not save him. And it says, send for Peter, he'll tell you words how you'll be saved. He had the word of knowledge. He knew the name of Peter without knowing Peter before. And he knew that 
Peter was in Joppa. He had that revelation that did not save him. We must make sure that we are saved. We're born again. And it says, he will tell you words whereby you will be saved. Don't stop at the point of, I'm a good Samaritan. I help people. I give money to the beggars. And I visit the sick. All those things are good. All those things are necessary. After you are saved, they are the product and the fruit of your salvation. But there are people that do that and they have their confidence, their reliance on good works. Good Samaritan. And that does not save. We're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I'm reading from verse 1. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, that's great, speaking in tongues, and have not charity, that's a terrible thing. You speak in tongues of men and of angels, and you don't have the charity that is implanted in the heart when we're born again and when we're sanctified. It says, I am become a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. Verse 2, and though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, loving God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, or your strength. If you don't have that, I am nothing. Verse 3, and though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, that's even going beyond a good Samaritan, that everything you have, you do not leave the last penny and the last dollar of the last pound, of the last naira, and you give everything to feed the poor. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burnt, burnt for religion, there are many people who are zealous for religion, zealous for their denomination, and they don't care, even if they are going to be burnt at the stake. They say, I will do anything. I will die for my religion and have not charity. It profiteth me nothing. All those things we do by human effort, animal energy, and strength and power. All the things we do that will become heroes in life. If we're not saved, if we're not born again, if we're not sanctified, if we do not have the holiness of God in our hearts, the prophet nothing. Romans chapter 12. I'll first of all read from verse 13. Romans chapter 12. I start from verse 13. Distributing to the necessity of the saints giving to hospitality. That's good. But you must remember verses 1 and 2. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. That's the first level. That's the foundation. That's the root. That's the indispensable experience. You've surrendered yourself to God. You've surrendered yourself to Christ. And you are totally abandoned unto God. That is your reasonable service. Before you come to verse 13, giving to hospitality. Look at verse 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed 
by the renewing of your mind. The renewing of your mind. The regeneration of your soul. The renewal of your very heart that takes place. You're saved and the grace of God comes into your heart and does the work of grace. After that, hospitality. Then he goes on to say that he may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I pray God will help us to balance up everything in our lives, in our behavior, in our character, in our ministry, in Jesus' name. I'm waiting for another amen. amen. Point number two now. I'm reading from First Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. First Timothy chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 15. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. Look at that. It's talking about the family. If they, husband and wife, continue in faith, in charity, in holiness, in sobriety, then the blessing of God will come on that wife that she shall deliver and shall be saved, protected in childbearing. But holiness must be the center of the home. Point number two, the insurance of sustained holiness in the home. It's something to be holy in the church. It's something to be holy outside when people contact you and when people have interaction with you. I want to show I'm a Christian. I want to show I'm born again. I want to show I'm a holy, saintly, sanctified believer and a member of Deep and Life Bible Church. I'm even a worker there. I'm even a minister there. But at home, how does that holiness play out? Between the husband and the wife, how does that holiness play out? And between the parents and the children, how does that holiness come out? It's one thing to see somebody on the street and they have a need. I'm a good Samaritan and I give them something. Do I give my wife all that support? Do I give my husband all that help? Do I have that holiness and do I have that hospitality to my own wife, to my own husband, to my own children, to my own parents? Point number two, the insurance of sustained holiness in the home. Holiness in the home. It tells us in First Thessalonians, First Thessalonians, I'm reading from chapter 4, and I'm reading from verse 3. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification. This is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye abstain from fornication. Paul, have you forgotten you are talking to believers? And you're talking about being saved and now sanctified and you are bringing in we abstain from fornication Paul says yes the maid at home the helper at home when your wife is not there between you and that maid that's going to preserve sanctification holiness Look at verse 4, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. 
that you don't do anything in the absence of your wife. And if you are the wife, you don't do anything in the absence of your husband that will dishonor you and dishonor your husband, dishonor your wife, and dishonor the family. You don't do anything that your children will hear, and then they have so much shame, they cannot go out of the door. Everybody has known what daddy did and what mommy did. Sanctification, holiness must be in the home. Look at verse 7. For God has not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. We'll be holy. Brothers and sisters, I said, will be holy. Look at Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. I'm reading from verse 4. Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed on the field. That's holiness. Holiness in the home. No stranger comes to your home in the absence of your partner, in the absence of your spouse. And then something is done that must not see the light of day. Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled. But all mongers and adulterers, God will judge. God will judge. Verse 9, be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines, for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats, which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. Holiness at home, holiness in our relationship, in a godly home, in a sanctified home, in a godly household, each, there is no hatred or harmfulness. There is no hatred or harmfulness. Oh, there is no offensiveness and obstinacy. No offensiveness and obstinacy. There's no part of the family endeavoring and making up their minds to be offensive to the partner or to the spouse just to irritate the husband or irritate the wife. Number three, L, there's no leaven of malice, leaven of anger, leaven of injustice, leaven of oppression. There is no leaven or lawlessness that the husband can go out without even telling the wife and the husband. Or the wife can go out visiting without telling the husband we're law abiding. And love means that we confide in each other. We relate with each other. And we do the things that is right. I know insincerity or insensitivity. Insincerity between husband and wife. And they're talking from the side of the mouth. In their heart, they know the absolute truth. And yet, in talking to the wife, he's going to be insincere. He tells his story. He fabricates his story. A story that is not true. To get the man on the go, chasing shadows. He's telling his story. And a story that is not true to get the wife on the go, chasing shadows and chasing mirage. There is no insincerity. There is no insensitivity. In a godly home where holiness abides, there is no nagging or neglect. Nagging, always complaining, always murmuring. You put this there. Why is it not there? You took that from there. Why did you put it there? Why did you remove it from there? And you acted like this and you acted like that. Ah, I remember. That's exactly what you did, you know, one month ago. And nagging and nagging and nagging. That's not a sanctified home. That's not a holy home. That's not a happy home. 
And that is not a home where God is honored, where the word of God is obeyed. No nagging or neglect. We don't deliberately neglect our wives. I'm going to church. And then you stay in church all day. By the time you come back, almost everybody is asleep. There's no fellowship. And they are so married to the church and married to the denomination that the wife is feeling all alone and lonely and there is no fellowship. That's not a holy home. If we're going to carry holiness to our homes, holiness to our households, holiness to the place we live, there will be no nagging or neglect. There is no enslavement or enmity. Enslavement, keep the wife in bondage. That's not Christianity. Get the wife in prison, house prison. That's not holiness and that's not Christianity. Enslavement or some, they do it to the husband and they command the husband, stay there. Don't stand up from there. Don't leave the house until I come. And you think it's a militant soldier talking, it's a wife talking to the enslaved husband. In a happy home, in a holy home, in a home where there is holiness, all that enslavement, all that enmity will not be there. In a holy home, there is no stranger, there's no substitute. There is no strange woman that comes in that the man is giving attention to. He has no attention for any strange woman. That strange woman may come from the same village, no attention. That strange woman may be the old girlfriend. When you were still in sin and you are not born again, there's no attention. That strange woman may be a lady you just met in your place of work. Uh, we can eat together. We can dine together. There is no chance and there is no allowance for the stranger and for a substitute. There will be nobody that will become a substitute for your wife. Your junior sister living with you. Or a woman that has been given to you to help in the household. There will be no stranger. There will be no substitute. There is no self-seeking. There is no selfishness. Where there is holiness in the home, there will be holiness in our homes. It starts with holiness in the heart. It's an experience that you have, that the Lord circumcises your heart, makes your heart holy and makes your heart sanctified and then because of that in the home there is age helpfulness helpfulness we're looking in at genesis chapter 2 verse 18 genesis chapter 2 verse 18 and the lord god said it is not good that the man should be alone I will make him and help meet for him. And help meet for him. There is helpfulness in the home. Helping one another to lift the body. Helping one another to be encouraged and to be excited at living. The husband will not be thinking of separation or divorce the wife will not be thinking of suicide or running away somewhere where she can hide ahead from all the oppression in the home there will be helpfulness oh there will be oneness oneness in matthew chapter 19 in a home where there's holiness in a home where holiness is entrenched, there will be oneness in Matthew chapter 19, reading from verse 4. And he said, and he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that which, that have we not, have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male, only one man, and female, only one woman? 
and said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh, oneness in the home, what is true holiness. Verse 6, Wherefore, they are no more twain, but one flesh, what therefore God has joined together, let no man put asunder. Any amen? amen? Nothing will put you and your wife, you and your husband asunder in Jesus' name. Money will not put you asunder. Profession will not put you asunder. A new business will not put you asunder. Even church will not put you asunder. A minister will not put you asunder. And a new car, a new property, landed property, and I'm building here, he is building over there. Building mansions will not put you asunder in Jesus' name. L there will be love, love in the family. Ephesians chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church. Love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church. We're looking at Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2, and I'm reading from verse 4, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, and to love their children. The husband loves the wife. Sincere love, transparent love, unpretending love, not hypocritical, is love without dissimulation. And the same thing, the wife loves the husband. That's holiness, helpfulness, oneness, love, intimacy. Intimacy. There's no hiding a bank account from the wife. There's no hiding of another account by the wife. There's no hiding of something in the phone, something on the iPad, something on the tablet, something on the desktop that you lock up so that the husband does not come there to see what you have. Or the wife does not come here there to see what you have. There is intimacy and there's no hiding where there's true holiness. But all these pretended, superficial, hypocritical, surface level holiness, that one will not make heaven. Isaiah chapter 58. Isaiah chapter 58. I'm reading from verse 7. Isaiah 58. Reading from verse 7. Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry? And that thou bring the poor that are cast out to thy house. And when thou seest the naked, that thou cover him. Look at this. And that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh. The two shall be one flesh. That you hide not yourself. From thine own flesh, there's intimacy, there's needfulness, needfulness. The very fact that the wife knows in her heart of hearts, my husband needs me. And my husband will allow me to see that he needs me. And the wife also will say, or the wife will know that I'm needed by my husband. It's not like if you are there, okay. 
if you are not there, okay, I can meet my own needs. I'm an adult now, after all, before I married. Can you guess how I took care of myself? I don't really need you, but I just got married. You don't really need me, but you just got married. There will be needfulness. We're looking at Proverbs chapter 31. Proverbs chapter 31. I'm reading from verse 10. Who can find a virtuous woman? For a price is above rubies. The heart of her husband does safely trust in her, so that she has no need of spoil. He has no need of spoil. She will do him good and not evil all the days of his life and her life. And then uh, there will be escape, escape from judgment. The husband is helping the wife, so the wife will escape. The wife is helping the husband, so the husband will escape. The parents are helping the children so that the children will escape, escape judgment, escape calamity, escape evil, escape oppression, escape everything that is negative. But while well, we're just living together, and the fellow is uh, going to do something harmful to himself, and she is doing something harmful to herself, but... She's an adult. If she thinks that that's the best for her, that's okay for her. If that hurts her life, she will learn a lesson. What if she dies and is not able to learn the lesson? Okay, if she dies, then you'll marry another person. That's not a good marriage. But escape will escape. You will escape. And your husband will not abandon you to perish in Jesus' name. Your wife will not abandon you to perish in Jesus' name. This is holiness in the home. We're looking at Genesis, and I'm reading from verse 15, chapter 19, verse 15. And when the morning arose, then the angels hastened, Lord, saying, Arise, take thy wife. You are going to heaven, take your wife with you. You are experiencing holiness, take your wife with you. You have a new experience of moving to the mountain top, take your wife with you. Saying, Arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters, which are here lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. And while he lingered, the man took late hold on his hand and upon the hand of his wife and upon the hand of his two daughters, the Lord be merciful unto him. And they brought him forth and set him without the camp, without the city. And it came to pass when they had, had them forth abroad, they had brought them forth abroad, that he said, Escape for thy life. Look not behind thee, neither stay thou in all the plain. Escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. We know what happened to that family. Lord was not a great help to the wife, a great encouragement to the wife, that he, she looked back. And Lord was not a great example to the daughters either. We know what happened after they got to war, where they got to be an encouragement to your wife, an encouragement to your husband that you will escape. We shall escape in Jesus' name. We're coming to Luke chapter 21. 
Luke chapter 21, verse 36. Watch ye therefore, and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape. Judgment is coming. All will be there. The great white throne judgment will come. All will be there. Christ is coming and is going to take the church away in a glorious rapture. Make sure that it's not just you that will escape the great tribulation. Your husband will escape. Your wife will escape. Your children will escape. Your parents will escape. Your siblings will escape. But we have to warn each other, help each other, watch over each other, encourage each other, watch it therefore. And pray always that she may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. The selflessness in holiness. If the marriage, if the family is really blessed with holiness, there will be the heirs of selflessness in serving each other. You put your wife first. In serving each other, you put your husband first. In providing for the family, you put your wife first. You put your children after. In preparing for the family, you put your husband first. And you put your children before yourself. There is that consideration of the other members of the family before yourself selflessness philippians chapter 2 verse 3 philippians chapter 2 verse 3 let nothing be done through strife of being glory but in lowliness of mind let each esteem better each uh, esteem other better than themselves you appreciate your wife, you honor your wife, you esteem your wife, you lift up your wife better than yourself. You're not always talking about, you know, when I was very young and, you know, I had this, I had this, I had that. And lifting up yourself and making the wife subservient and making the wife, uh, you know, down there. I didn't have that experience. I didn't go that to that place. I didn't have that one. Let nothing be done through strife for being glory. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves look not every man on his own things but every man also on the things of others you look at what will benefit your wife and the wife will look at what will benefit the husband in verse 5 let this might be in you which was also in christ jesus who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of his servant and was made in the likeness of men. Let the love in your family, the holiness in your family be scriptural, scriptural, scriptural. So that anything you are going to do, what does the scripture say? Any decision you are going to make, what does the scripture say? Any plan you are having, what does the scripture say? As you come together, rub minds together, take decisions together, and walk together in this way of life. You are asking, you know, what does the scripture say? So that everything you do, you do according to the scriptures. The Lord will give you grace. And when it comes to time to apply all these uh, areas of the word of God in our family, the Lord will bring it to your remembrance in Jesus' name. I'm looking at Acts of the Apostles, chapter 18. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 18. I'm reading from verse 24. And a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. 
This man was instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla, husband and wife, Aquila and Priscilla had heard they, both of them, took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. Husband and wife having the knowledge of the word of God, husband and wife, helping another preacher, husband and wife, coming together, combining together, to lift up and to encourage and to enlighten another preacher. Not that the husband will say, all right, my wife, go back home. I want to help this man. There are people that say they are preachers, they are ministers, and their wives are nowhere to be found spiritually. Their wives are not in agreement with them in the work of God. Their wives are not bringing up themselves. And the husband is not bringing up the wife to make the wife relevant in the ministry. Or there may be wives that, you know, I, I believe in the Lord. I'm consecrated to the Lord. The man is low and sluggish. I'm not going to wait for him. Uh, marriage does not concern the work of God. I'm going, I'm going, I'm going going and I can't even travel I've gone to do the work of God and the man is you know just at home cooking for himself what kind of family is that what kind of zeal is that we must be scriptural Aquila and Priscilla they join together in helping Apollos I must ask you you are a coordinator how about your wife you're a preacher how about your wife your zeal is in the work of God. How about your wife? You're consecrated and committed. How about your wife? Do you make any effort at all? Well, I tried some time ago and I tried to, you know, bring her along. And she was going to drag me back. And so I said, okay, stay by yourself. That's separation. That's separation. Don't tell her stay by yourself. Bring her near. And let the word of God enrich her life like the word of God is enriching your life. There are some people in our church here, I know them zealous and fervent. If I saw their wives on the street, I would not even know their wife. The wife is not that engaged, occupied in the work of the Lord. That's not the will of God. We know you, we want to know your wife. You're serviceable, well, to see that your wife is serviceable. You're fervent, well, to see that your wife is fervent. You're not going to a different heaven. If she is going to the same heaven, be scriptural and bring her along in the work of the Lord. Look at Romans chapter 16. In Romans chapter 16, I'm reading from verse 3. Greet Priscilla and Aquila. My helpers in Christ Jesus. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus, who have for my life laid down their own necks, plural, both of them, unto whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. They were both consecrated and committed. They, so, they surrendered their house for the work of the Lord. There will be holiness in our families. Holiness in our homes. Helpfulness to one another. Oneness with one another. Love to each other. Intimacy with each other. Needfulness of one another escaping from judgment and calamity being held by one by each other selflessness and being scriptural it will happen in your family 
Is somebody not saying amen? They have said it will happen in your family. It will happen in Jesus' name. Point number three now, the importance of scriptural holiness to enter heaven. The importance of scriptural holiness to enter heaven. Underline that word, scriptural. There is self-made holiness. That one is not scriptural. It's like self-righteousness. That self-righteousness in the sight of God is like filthy rags. And that one has no quality in the sight of the Almighty God. There's boastful holiness. I am holier than other people. And they think that's enough. I am outwardly righteous like the Pharisee. Look at what I wear. Look at what I don't wear. Outwardly righteous like the Pharisees. I'm liberal to the poor. I'm generous. I am liberal. And they think that liberality that is self-made coming out of their lives, they think that's enough. I'm innocent from societal ills. What society people do, I don't do. And I'm innocent. I emulate great heroes in society, in a history. I look at history, the history of our land, and the history of the church, and I pick up heroes there, and without salvation, and without sanctification, I emulate great heroes in history. I am numbered among the best at home, at work, in the office. I am numbered among the best. And I serve humanity the best way I know how. I'm sincere in all I do. They think that kind of man-made holiness, holier than thou, outwardly righteous, liberal, innocent, numbered among the best in the books of who and who, who is who, emulating heroes, serving humanity, sincere in all the due, the thing that's all that is needed, all that is self-made, all that is what a Pharisee can do, all that is what somebody who does not even believe in the existence of God can do. In fact, that's what they boast about. I don't go to church, but look at me. I'm making myself a hero. I don't read the Bible, but look at me. I'm liberal. I don't go to church, but look at me. I am serving humanity. All that will not get anyone to heaven. But it is the holiness from the heart that Christ himself has given. That the holiness that will take us to heaven. I will get there. I said, I will get there. We'll get there in Jesus' name. All these uh, man-made holiness, I am this, I am that, by myself. I don't need prayer. I don't need salvation. I don't need Christ. I can do it by myself. I pray God will save us from all that in Jesus' name. Look at First Peter chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 15 and verse 16. First Peter chapter 1, verse 15, verse 16. But as he which has called you is holy, so be ye holy. In all manner of conversation, because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. It's a holiness that is related to the holiness of God. Be ye holy, for I am holy. We're looking at Exodus chapter 15, verse 11. Exodus chapter 15, I'm reading from verse 11. Who is like unto thee, O Lord? Among the gods, who is like unto thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, 
doing wonders. Look at verse 13. Thou in thy mercy hast led forth the people which thou hast redeemed. Thou hast guided them in thy strength unto thy holy habitation. God is holy. His habitation is holy. God is holy. His heaven is holy. God is holy. His angels are holy. God is holy. His spirit is holy. The Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost. God is holy. His son is holy. God is holy. Even the serve, those who serve him in heaven, they're holy. Holy habitation. Holy temple. Everything about God is holy. I want you to realize that and come into this experience and say, Lord, make me holy through and through. He will do it. Leviticus chapter 11, verse 44. Leviticus 11. I'm reading from verse 44. In verse 44, For I am the Lord your God. Ye shall therefore sanctify yourselves, and ye shall be holy, for I am holy. Ye shall be holy, for I am holy. Leviticus chapter 20, verse 7. Leviticus 20, verse 7. Sanctify yourselves, therefore, and be ye holy, for I am the Lord your God. And ye shall keep my statutes and do them. I am the Lord which sanctify you. Will be holy in Jesus' name. Deuteronomy chapter 23. I read from verse 14. Deuteronomy chapter 23. I'm reading from verse 14. In verse 14 it says, For the Lord thy God walketh in the midst of thy camp to deliver thee and to give up thine enemies before thee. Therefore shall thy camp, tell me, therefore shall thy church be holy, thy camp be holy, thy assembly be holy, thy congregation be holy. Therefore shall thy camp be holy, that he see no unclean sin in the midst of thee, and turn away from thee. If he sees an unclean sin, iniquity, sin, he will turn away. Joshua chapter 7. Joshua chapter 7. I'm reading from verse 8. Joshua chapter 7. Let's go to verse 9. And Judges chapter 7, reading from verse 9. In verse 9, for the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land shall hear of it and shall environ us around and cut off our name from the earth. And what wilt thou do unto thy great name? And the Lord said unto Joshua, Get thee up. Wherefore liest thou upon thou upon thy face? Israel has sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. For they have even taken of their cursed sin, and have also stolen and dissembled also, and have put it even among their own stuff. Therefore the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies, because they were accursed. Listen to this, neither will I be with you anymore. Neither, God said, will he be with them anymore except he destroy their cursed sin from among you. 
He doesn't want any sin, any uncleanness, any evil abiding in the congregation, in the church, in the camp, in the assembly. Otherwise, it will turn away. I pray sin will not drive the presence of God away from our church in Jesus' name. And sin will not hinder us from getting to heaven in Jesus' name. But remember, there will be no sin in heaven. There will be no unrighteous sinner in heaven. There will be no unrighteous churchgoer in heaven. If we're going to get to heaven, sin must be totally taken away. And thank God, the Lord is able he will do it. Psalm 15, I'm reading from verse 1. Psalm 15, verse 1, Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? He that walketh uprightly and walketh righteousness and speaketh the truth in his heart. He that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor. In whose eyes a vile person is contained, but he honoreth them that fear the Lord. He that sweareth his own heart, and he changes not. He that putteth not out his money to usury, selfish gain, unlawful interest, nor taketh reward against the innocent, he that doeth these things shall never be moved. God will help us to get to heaven. Psalm 24, verse 3. In Psalm 24, verse 3, who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord, or who shall stand in his holy place? He that has clean hands and a pure heart, he that has clean hands, and a pure heart who has not lifted up his soul unto vanity and no sworn deceitfully. That holiness that qualifies us for heaven, the Lord will give to everyone. Matthew chapter 5, verse 8. Matthew chapter 5, verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. I will see God on the final day. I said, I will see God on the final day. He will prepare us. He will purify us. We'll see him on that final day in Jesus' name. Hebrews chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 14. Hebrews chapter 12. Verse 14, follow peace with all men and holiness. Tell me the rest. Look at your voice. Tell me the rest. Without which no man shall see the Lord. We'll see the Lord on the final day in Jesus' name. Ephesians chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 25. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives. Even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Why? Why the sacrifice? Why did he do what he did? Why did he shed his blood? That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. That he might present it to himself when he comes back when he comes for the church in the rapture, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be, tell me, tell yourself, tell your neighbor, tell the church that it should be holy and without blemish. I want to encourage you ministers and I want to say 
that as we go back to the local church, to the district church, and to the group, let's emphasize the very fact that Samaritan hospitality is not enough. Self-made hospitality and holiness is not enough. The holiness that comes from heaven, the holiness that comes from the heart of Christ, and the holiness that flows from Calvary must enter into our lives. Let's assure all the workers it's good to work for God. It's good to be very zealous in the work of God, but the zeal alone is not sufficient. There must be holiness of heart, holiness of mind, holiness in our soul, holiness in our spirit, holiness in our home, holiness in the office, holiness when we're alone, holiness when we're with others. There must be that witness of the Holy Spirit spirit within us that the Lord has saved us and sanctified us and has made us holy and has prepared us for heaven then when the trumpet shall sound we shall be there our members shall be there our church will be there in Jesus name encourage husbands and wives husbands love your wife wives love your husband and follow peace with each other and holiness without which no man shall save the lord encourage members of the church that members of the church follow peace with your minister follow peace with other members of the church and holiness without which no man shall save the lord remind yourself that no matter who you are in the house of god you must follow peace with your minister follow peace with other ministers follow peace peace with other members and follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. The Lord is willing to make us holy through and through. He will do it in our heart. He will do it in our mind. And then to enter heaven, that man that came to the Lord, what shall I do to enter into the kingdom of God and to have eternal life? Thou shalt love the Lord with all thy heart and all thy soul and all thy mind and all thy strength and love your neighbor as yourself. The grace of God helping us to do that when that trumpet shall sound. Thank God I will be there. I said, thank God I will be there. I said, thank God I will be there. Rise up and surrender yourself once again to the Lord. Present yourself once again unto the Lord. Let what we have heard, let it bear fruit in our heart, bear fruit in our home, bear fruit in our tongue, bear fruit in our action, bear fruit in everything we do, in church, at home, in the office, in the market, everywhere. Let the word of God, of God bear the fruit of holiness in our lives.